Hello, hello, and uh, welcome back to another episode of Minority Reports podcast and digital series. I am your host, Mona Shake. You guys, I uh, had to take a bit of a day off yesterday. I have just, I've been spent. I've been uh, working nonstop, working weekends, working weekdays. Uh, and yesterday was uh, a kind of a day where Mona's brain was like, nope, we're not going to do anything. So I am back today. Very excited. Uh, hi, James. Nice to see you. James said, wow, Friday already. Yep. Tempest forget. I don't know what that means. Happy weekend, everybody. Happy weekend to you, James. Well, today I'm very excited about our guest because um, he's been friends with me on Facebook for a little bit and I've been very fascinated by the work that he does. Uh, he is uh, has a nonprofit by the name of Salam, which means hello in uh, in uh, I guess in uh, in Islam. Uh, it, it's, 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 Salam is more like peace be upon you. Uh, and he is also the author of Why Do They Hate Us? And I want to ask him why do they hate us? Here is our author Steve Slocum. How are you? Hey, good. Thanks. I'm great. Nice to see you, Steve. I'm very excited about this uh, conversation. Yeah, nice to see you. I wanted to kind of jump right into it. Um, I was reading some of the articles on you, and one of the articles talks about how you went as a missionary to Kazakhstan, and you and your family lived there for five years. Tell me about that and why Kazakhstan. Oh, wow, Kazakhstan. Well, uh, um, it was kind of random, actually. Uh, you know, I, I um, was a hardcore evangelical Christian, and um, you know, part part of that package is that you know we we have the truth and we love everybody, and so we have to take the truth to everybody so they won't go to hell, right? So, uh, so that was the motivation, and um, and Kazakhstan just happened to open up uh, in the time window. When when um, we, we decided we wanted to go. That was 1992. And, um, you know, the Soviet Union had just kind of come apart at that time. And Kazakhstan was one of the um, the nascent republics um, that mm-hmm. emerged uh, um, when the Soviet Union came apart. So that's how we ended up there. How interesting. So, I mean, and you had been a hardcore evangelical for how many years before that? Oh gosh! Um, it started when I um, when I went to university. Um, so uh, it had been over ten years. It had been over ten years. Yeah. Uh, you know, I um, I think what I'm um, fascinated by, and I think a lot of people are you still in a hardcore evangelical, or is that has that shifted for you? No, that the, that was uh, that's part of the story. Is that um, you know living in Kazakhstan for five years. Uh, that was a, a real game changer for me. Um, for me, it was like you know, I, I believed, I believed in what I what I was taught. You know, I believed with all my heart, and um, so much that I was willing to take my family, my wife at that time, and, and my three children, and to you know, you know to a, an undeveloped country at the time, right. and uh, you know, f- all for you know my, my beliefs. Um, but I feel like when I was there. What happened was, you know, it's kind of like the Truman Show, you know, when he, he he's sailing his boat and he find, he bumps up against the edge of his world and finds finds the edges of it. I felt like that happened to me when I was there, yeah. um, and that happened, yeah, in a, in a couple of ways. One, one by um, seeing the culture there, li- living. I mean, you know, we, we really immersed. Um, for five years, we spoke we spoke Kazakh language. We sat on the floor, we drank tea. We we had all you know. There, there weren't any other white people around, hardly at all. Um, you know, our, we were just immersed into the culture, and they loved us, and we loved them. And um, so, some of these ideas, you know, start to you know start start to to dissipate in terms of you know you need you need what we have. Um, they, they seemed pretty fine um, to me, and at the same time, the the small group of missionaries um, that we were involved with, well, things were just coming apart. It was a, it was a real disaster in terms of, you know, uh, this group that's supposed to be uh, having all the answers and, and coming with the truth that it was, um, it was, it was honestly, it was a disaster. So those two things happening at the same time 
caused me to really have a shift. So no, I am no longer uh, an evangelical by, by any stretch, um, much more of a universalist now in terms of I, I just applaud every individual's uh, pursuit of whatever they consider to be their spiritual truth, or, you know, their pursuit of the divine. And I honor that. And, you know, we all have to find our own way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, Steve, I can, um, you know, I grew up in, uh, I was born and partially raised in Pakistan. So Pakistan is a very conservative Muslim country, uh, as you probably already know. Um, and, you know, I performed the Holy Pilgrimage when I was 11 years old, which is considered a oh, wow. big privilege at that age. Yeah, I performed the Holy Pilgrimage three times. So it's, uh, mm. it's, it's a very intense process. It's pretty hardcore. Um, and I can tell you that after that, mm. I can tell you, like, I very vividly remember how my, it almost like I had this spirituality shift. It's almost like I was traveling on one road. And after I performed the Holy Pilgrimage, I was on another path. It was like this shift wow. that happened to me. And it wasn't like praying five times a day or fasting. It wasn't about that. It was believing in something much bigger than yourself. It's, uh, you know, even at 11, it's almost like I had this kind of awakening of like, wow, you know, the, the world doesn't uh, revolve around you. Like there is a, there is a being, you want to call it God, Allah, oy vey, you want to call it Gavalt, you want to call it Jesus, whatever you want to call it. This, 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 uh, this, uh, energy source is much bigger than us yeah. and, um, yeah. it loves us. It really does love us, and I think that was uh, that has been my kind of spiritual path. Uh, I've never heard of the term universalist. Do explain. To oh you. What well, is you haven't. Yeah, no. I mean that that's more. Um, you know, everybody everybody finds their own way, and there's and there's some some truth. You know. In, in what yeah. we all find, you know, um, I mean, the, the, the earth is round and it's filled with different peoples and cultures. And, um, you know, of, of yeah. course, all of us over time are going to develop, you know, um, differing ideas about why we're here and, you know, um, some ideas about, about um, uh, you know, uh, the divine. And um, so, yeah, I, I just... You know, I, I, I just can't, because of the fact that for so long, I really believed that I had found the, the one truth um, mm -hmm. and realizing how wrong I was about that. Um, I just find myself unable to, I, you know, I'm not just going to join another team, you know, um, and, and go through that whole thing again. Um, so I, I just, you know, I, I just have a, a difficult time saying that, no, you know, what you believe is wrong. Uh, what I believe is right. So I just that for that reason, I find myself in more of a, a universalist um, position that that right. everyone finds their own path and they all you know go up the same mountain. Yeah, I mean, Steve, what I'm curious is uh, curious about is uh, you know in your San Diego Tribune article, you talk about how when you lived in Kazakhstan, your experience with the Muslim families that you came across and your Muslim friends was so different. And then uh, not too long after that, sadly, September 11th happened. And then there was this mm. anti-Muslim, Islamophobic, you know, thing going on in America where it was just like, oh, you're a Muslim, are you a terrorist? You know, um, I lived in New York City at the time and I personally experienced mm. that. I mean, I uh, even mm. got laid off of jobs just because, you know, they were they didn't lay anybody else around me. They're off, but I got laid mm. off and uh you know, wow. and it made you started questioning. You're like, well, I, I don't, I know, I don't understand. So, what was it so different for you that you experienced in Kazakhstan that made you go, no, I, I can't be anti-Muslim because I saw something very different. What, what, what were yeah. those things that you saw? Gosh, you know, um, you know, like I said, we were we were just um, immersed in the culture. All our all our friends, our neighbors, you know, we, we just loved them. They were inviting us to their kids' birthday parties, to their weddings, to funerals, um, you know, to picnics. You know, they they were just our friends. They just they just rolled us up into their community. It was like, you know, they didn't care, you know, that 
that we, we had a different color skin, that we, we spoke their language poorly. Uh, although, you know, we, we didn't do half bad. My kids were pretty, pretty fluent. Um, but they just, they were, it was a wonderful, welcoming, hospitable, you know, generous, kind um, culture that, that just, even though, you know, here they are as a, as a Muslim background people, and they knew we were there <laughs> as missionaries, you know, but even so, they they just welcomed us so warmly. I had never ever ever experienced this kind of warmth and hospitality um, before, mm -hmm. and um, it just melted, um, you know, so many things for me. And so, so when I came back, and you know, shortly after we got back, nine eleven happened. You know, I, I just. Um, that experience that was, you know, more than a mental experience. It was, it was a deep, you know, emotional, um, spiritual kind of experience that, you know, changed me deeply. I, I just, it, it just never even occurred to me. It just that this idea that, you know, Muslims are scary people um, because of nine 11. Um, just, I just couldn't, I couldn't get there. I mean, I was confused like everyone else. It's like, sure. like, how did this happen? What, why did they do this? I was very confused, but um, I wasn't buying into this, you know, blanket idea that Islam, you know, is a scary religion and Muslims are scary people. I, I just that that couldn't get into me. Mm -hmm. Steve, do you feel like, you know, this anti-Muslim sentiment that rose after September 11th um, and, uh, you know, all the other minorities were like, thank you, Muslims, for taking the blame and thank you for taking the heat off of us. For a little bit, um, I have some uh, black and Latino uh, comedian friends. They're like, "Oh, thank God!" Uh, the you know after September 11th, the uh, the way the attention shifted on Muslims, and they could just give us a break for a little bit, which is sad if you really think about it on a grander scale. You're mm -hmm. just like, "Oh shit!" Like as if somebody, some minority, always has to be a target, right? Um, and sadly, after September 11th, it was Muslims like myself who became you know targets, or you know where, whether it was verbal or losing your job or whatever those things were, I feel like, do you, you know, do you feel like it's because you had that personal experience that, you know, wouldn't allow you to accept this anti-Muslim sentiment? And do you feel like if more, uh, uh, I guess you can say more, uh, Amer you know, non-Muslim people in America had similar experiences to you, that would be less anti-Muslim sentiment? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that up because really, um, um, in, in, in my view of it, as I've looked at it over the last 20 years, um, since nine 11, mm -hmm. I really feel like that where we are today, you know, yeah. exactly where we are today in terms yeah. of, you know, what happened to the Capitol building on January 6th, I feel like nine 11 was the beginning of that. Because, you know, be, before 9-11, I mean, I, I know I'm, I, I'm not, I'm speaking as a white person, so I can't, you know, I can't at all speak for your, your, your African-American friends or, or other, you know, racial groups who feel like they were being discriminated against. But I feel like at least there was some semblance of political correctness, you know, that, you know, you couldn't just no politicians couldn't just say this stuff out loud. I mean, I remember watching news shows where, you know, politicians were being grilled, you know, because they, they, you know, said maybe one sentence that could be considered racist. And, and, you know, they, they were, you know, looking at, you know, their careers being over and that sort of thing. You know, we were in that, that period of political correctness, but after nine 11, you know, it just became so okay, you know, yeah. you know, the evangelical leaders led the way in saying awful, horrible things about Muslims and just, just blurting it out there, you know, um, as a politician in a, in a public scenario. And it just became okay to say anything you wanted, anything you wanted about Muslims. Um, nothing was too terrible. And I feel like for me, that sort of, that sort of idea, that sort of um, open hatred, that sort of, you know, letting the genie out of the bottle uh, of hatred. It's like, it's like dropping a pebble in a pond. It's not, it's not a vector, you know, that you can direct at one group. You know, it, it ends up going out circularly, you know, and, and right. towards everyone. And so these, all these, 
um, closet racists who had been, you know, in, in back rooms of bars, you know, doing their racism, you know, now they could come out, you know, into the open right. and it, and it was, you know, directed towards everyone and because it was okay now to say that, that sort of stuff towards Muslims. So I really feel like that was, was a, a huge turning point in terms of the um, reinvigoration of white supremacy um, in the United States. Right. Right. I mean, it's an interesting point. You just, uh, brought up about letting the genie out of the bottle. Now, I've had a few guests uh, come on on my podcast here, and we've talked about this. Uh, President Obama talked about, um, you know, he was being asked, how do you put the genie back in the bottle that has been unleashed during the Trump administration, right? This blatant mm-hmm. racism, blatant misogyny, blatant, you know, basically just hate, uh, you know, where... where mm-hmm. It, it, you know, it's totally uh, you have a uh, somebody like that by the name of Marjorie Taylor Greene currently uh, who's been taken off committees because she's out there, you know, you know, tweeting QAnon, the conspiracy theories and all this nonsense. And then now you, and, it's, and it's interesting. You brought up Jeannie in the bottle during the, you know, after September 11th and during the Bush administration. So it almost feels like it's like um, it, 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 it's like a graduation, right? Oh, September 11th happened. Oh, it's open season on Muslims. Okay. Then uh, Trump comes along and says Mexicans are rapists and Mexicans are this and, you know, black people are that and Muslims are this and we're going to put a Muslim ban. Okay, great. Now we graduate to that level. I mean, do you feel like the genies have been let out of the bottles by the likes of your Bush and your Trumps? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Bush started it, of course. Um, and, you know, he's the one, he's the one. And, and the title of my book, you know, I get a lot of questions about the title of my book. Why do they hate us? You know, they're, they're like, well, but wait, Muslims don't hate us. Why do you, why would you even title your book that way? Well, the, the, the title of my book is actually a quotation and, and, and it's on the back cover. So people have to, you know, read, read the, see the front cover and the title and then turn the back cover over and, and read what the book's really about. But anyway, why do they hate us? That was George Bush's question. Uh, when he gave his speech to the to the I joint session that. of Congress a few days after 9-11. And he asked that question and he said, why did they hate us? And his answer was, well, they hate our freedoms. They hate they hate the way our, you know, our way of life, blah, 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 which was, you know, of course, um, completely not not true. Um, but it led the way for, for, you know, you know, the invasion of Afghanistan and then followed by the invasion of Iraq. So so anyway, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I got rambling and I forgot what your question was. No, my question was, I I think you pretty much answered my question about these genies that have been let out. It's almost like, you know, you know, this whole slogan, the the red hat MAGA wearing douchebags who walk around, Mm -hmm. who are just like, oh, make America great again. It's like, it's like, look, America, America is a great country. There's no denying about that. I, as an immigrant, can definitely vouch for it, right? Um. Uh, but we also have our flaws, right? Uh, only less, only barely a hundred years ago, women just started to vote. Only a hundred years ago, okay? Yeah. Uh, there's this horrible, uh, you know, history of four hundred years of slavery, which we somehow very, you know, very conveniently choose to not put in our history book, so our kids don't have to learn the harsh realities and the harsh truth of how this country was founded, right? So there, there's all these things where you're just like. Yes, we are, but we still can progress. But it feels like with Bush and with Trump, it's almost like we've taken, we've went backwards. We've went backwards a lot because of these guys, because this kind of hateful rhetoric that has been constantly put out, this kind of phobia. Oh my God, you have Muslims moving in your neighborhood? Oh my God, make sure, make sure that, you know, they're not like involved in bombing. I, you know, Steve, this is so crazy. I, as a stand up comic, I've been very fortunate to perform in a lot of really great places. And uh, I was doing a show in Vegas of all freaking places. And um, this was a room of like full 400 people. It was jam packed. People were drinking, having a good time. I'm like the second person up that goes up. Um, and um, after I did my set, which went really well, I get off the stage and the host of the show goes, I, I thought this bitch was a terrorist. Wow. Right. Wow. So you think about you think about now, maybe he was trying to say it in jest. Right. 
but it's still like you know reiterating that narrative of if you're muslim right. there's like terrorism attached to it and let mm-hmm. me just say mm-hmm. terrorists would never hire me i'm too attractive um <laughs> they don't hire attractive people they don't it's the truth but i i'm <laughs> fascinated by this narrative that even after all these years since september 11th has happened that that is the perception that Muslims are constantly put in. Like, no matter what, I mean, let's not forget that right now we're in the middle of a fucking pandemic. Sorry, um, I have a tendency of cursing. Um, and uh, the two, uh, what, what are the, you know, uh, which, which one is it? Is it the, uh, is it uh, uh, Moderna, if I'm not mistaken, has been uh, discovered by two Muslim Turkish scientists, husband yeah. and wife. Yeah, yeah. Muslims, contribution to society. Yeah. Awesome. You know, but uh, yeah. what I wanted to uh, ask you was about your nonprofit name, Salam. What what made you find this nonprofit? And I see you have a banner of it in the back. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, I wrote my book, and and you know, my book my book goes through some. Uh, it, what I what I try to do with my book was just answer a lot of these questions for all of these these misperceptions that people have. I just tried to answer answer all those questions because I went down that same path, you know, as a, as a really serious Christian, I didn't understand so many things. My, you know, my ideas about Islam were given to me by Christians who thought all Muslims were going to hell, you know? So, so, so I had, you know, completely um, false ideas. So anyway, I, I wrote my book to sort of correct that. And it was my own journey of, of what I learned about Islam, starting from, you know, the childhood of, of uh, Muhammad and um, on through to, you know, modern, modern day Islam. And then, you know, some of the, um, the, the American foreign policy that has actually tr- what, what um, terrorism is really about anyway. Right. Um, so here I am rambling again and forgetting your question. Oh no, my question point, was point about in the right your, direction nonprofit. Again. your, your nonprofit. Okay. Salam. Yeah. Why, so, why, why is this nonprofit? So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the last chapter of my book is about what. Is, so what do we do about this? How do we how do we uh, help in this this situation of this this really bad um, um, feelings towards Muslims? Um, and so I you know I just encourage people to come together. So I realized that just writing about it wasn't really going to be enough. So I decided to uh, just um, you know fa- found this nonprofit for uh, the specific purpose of bringing Muslims and and um, non-Muslims together. So we do different events, um, you know, at various levels. Um, we, we start with, you know, simple awareness events and um, then um, move on to <clears throat> have, having non-Muslims actually visit a mosque and just see what goes on inside of a mosque. And mm. we friendship dinners where we bring Muslims and non-Muslims together, share a meal together. Um, so that's what the nonprofit is about. It just, it puts some, it puts some feet, um, underneath some of the ideas that, you know, I, I bring out in my book. Right. So you're, um, it sounds like your real objective behind this is like just to humanize Muslims. Yeah. I mean, to humanize them, but, um, more, more than that, in, in that, um, you know, I, I want, you know, when, when people meet each other, I, like we do these friendship dinners. And, um, um, you know, um, people, you listen to the conversations and, you know, here we have you know, people that are, are so different, so different in terms of what they look like and maybe, you know, maybe what they believe. But here they are, you know, at this dinner talking about their families, talking about their kids and how they're doing in school and talking about their parents, you know, they're getting getting older and, you know, what, what are they going to going to do and you know it just this this common humanity which just happens when people come together face to face they're not you know they're not they're not settling anything you know political they're not you know talking about the religion they're just talking you know as they're eating about what life is like for them and i just find when when that you know scenario is created you know c- good things happen and and from there um you know, it's it's really easy to to get you know to deeper levels of of conversation. You know, once you get you know to that point. Right, right, absolutely. I mean, have you? So it's just about bringing Muslims and and and, and who's cooking, Steve? Are you cooking? 
Why is this being catered? <laughs> what kind of food is being oh, served, at the, Steve? At the I'm dinners? Curious. No, you, <laughs> no. Um, the the one I did I did cook once. Um, I hosted a group of um, ladies actually from Saudi Arabia, believe it or not, and wow. um, it was uh, it was through uh, uh, the the diplomatic um, corps here in San Diego, and um, there were these all these these visitors from Saudi Arabia. And <laughs> so I cooked a bunch of a uh, lamb for, for all these ladies and serve and served it to them. I, I thought it was just really cool for me um, as a man to serve all these ladies their dinner. Um, but anyway, no, normally we, um, I, I, I have a, a, a host family who will be, or, or, or an organization that will be, you know, hosting the event and they handle the food and I'm just there facilitating. Um, I, I, st- I stay out of the food part of it as much as I can. <laughs> what? Why? Why are you hosting a bunch of Saudi ladies for dinner? Is um, what I'm curious about. <laughs> <clears throat> it was a. Um, it was an event um, that was. Um, um, ladies uh, night. It was a, like event? a. a Right, right. No, I don't. I don't mean event. It was. It was a two-week uh, period where there were all these Saudi visitors um, in San Diego, and so um, I, I was. I'm connected to this um, San Diego Diplomatic Council, um, who who's um, connected to the State Department, and and so um, I'm. Whenever um, Muslim visitors from out of town are here, um, uh, they tell me, and when I was. What I, what I prefer to do is get a group together around that and um, give people the opportunity, you know, to meet, you know, more than, you know, Muslim Americans, which is great, but, um, you know, to, to meet Muslims, you know, from you know, actual Saudi Arabia, um, you know, is a, is a fantastic opportunity, you know, for Americans. So anyway, that was the goal. But, you know, I, I think I had, I was, I had been out of town. I didn't have time to organize anything. I just came back that same day. <laughs> Here I am cooking dinner for like six six um saudi women and 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 the interpreter um was yeah. was a male so luckily we <laughs> we had that to kind of yeah. uh, help 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 out in the uh, in the awkwardness well it it's nice to see a man once uh, for once serve uh, women with food so it's uh it's definitely a joy to see that um you know it's just it's nice it's nice especially as muslim women you know we usually are the ones doing the serving so it's nice to be served by a dude yeah, I felt it was symbolic. I mean, I just really enjoyed it. I took a lot of pictures, and um, yeah, I thought it was really symbolic, and I really enjoyed it. I I, I love that. Now, have you been to Saudi Arabia? No, 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 I haven't been to Saudi Arabia. Um, what about? Have you visited any other Muslim countries, or what has your experience been? Um, I've been I've been to Turkey. I've been to Malaysia, um, and and the other. The other republics around Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, um, Turkmenistan. I've been, I've been to all of those. So yeah, I've been Turkmenistan a is a very interesting country because their president believes he is the prophet. He is like the last prophet or something. He has like resurrected oh. statues of himself all around. He's a very oh, wow. he's a very interesting character. Yeah, it's he's almost like Borat, but on acid okay. he's like on acid he's kind of like that <laughs> okay. he's like yeah out there. i mean i remember yeah even when i was there i remember um and over the years that you know he was he definitely was a very um kind of you know very you know kind of hero sort of uh personality but i didn't know he <laughs> had taken it to that level <laughs> he's 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 definitely really uh yeah, he's yeah, like out there. He's, he's a very interesting character. He's like resurrected, um, you know, all these like uh, statues and telling people that he's like the prophet and he is here to spread the word of God mm-hmm. and why he should stay in power. Wow. And this is not me coming up with it. This is me actually talking to a person from Turkmenistan telling me this. Okay. And she actually told me when she went back to visit Turkmenistan, she can't even, she has to be very hush hush when she's in the country because they don't like it when you leave the country. The president doesn't like oh, wow. it. Yeah, he's very kind of like Kim Jong un 
uh, like he's kind of like the Muslim version of Kim Jong Un a little bit, but maybe maybe okay. with a better hair, maybe with a better haircut. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm just saying, like just maybe a little bit. But um, see, this this nonprofit that you've been doing, do you see a, a dialogue that has started among people? Do you see a shift in people? Is this uh? Or are you getting like I don't know hate mail from people and they're like uh, spray painting your house and calling you a Muslim lover or something, which necessarily <laughs> isn't a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, well, um, we've had we've had some some um, ups and downs, but mostly ups. Um, I'm careful about the audience. I mean, I don't I don't take this out into you know the middle of you know um, Trump planned um for lack of a better word um i i take it to people who are going to be receptive but here's what i find even those people who are you know on the left um they're very progressive thinkers um i'm telling you they have the same the exact same misperceptions exact they don't act on mm -hmm. them they're not they're not mean they don't they don't you know come out and um you know, uh, discriminate and, and persecute and, and commit hate crimes, but they, they still have those same ideas, you know, deep down. So those are the people that I like to, you know, to work with. You know, I find those people are very, very, very receptive um, mm -hmm. to, the, you know, um, the things that they learn from, you know, the, the Muslim speakers that, that I bring in because they don't, they don't want to have this fear. They don't want to have this, this negative, you know, image, you know, they want to like them, but they just don't have the information to, you know, make that happen. So when I bring these speakers in and they actually meet them and talk to them and see how and they see how kind they are, how friendly they are, and they learn a little bit about what I uh, learn a little bit about what Islam is really about. It, yeah. They, they just love it. The, the energy is incredible. just incredible, positive energy. Yeah. Great uh, question and answer sessions. Um, so yeah, I find it, it's been very rewarding and very positive um, on that level. Yeah. We, we did have one event um, out in, um, it was out in Ramona, which is a, um, you know, a kind of a, um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say bad things about, about anyone, but it's, it's definitely, a, it's a call it conservative, conservative district. It's part of a district, uh, I think 56, um, which was Duncan Hunter's um, district. And, you know, very, very Republican, very conservative. And so we had a little event out there in the, in the public library that was open to the public. And, um, the, the speakers, and you know, the, these speakers, they're, they're incredible. They're, they're just humble, soft spoken, um, kind, you know, really, um, intelligent. Um, so, you know, they gave their talks for, and everyone listened kindly. And then, then was the Q and A and, um, Wow. Um, and the, the Q and a was probably 10 to 15 people, um, were just, you know, they were just, um, rabid, you know, I mean, the looks on their faces, the, their eyes were big. They were just like this, like, Oh my gosh, it was, it was frightening. I mean, I was standing in front with the speakers and seeing all of this <laughs> and they, they just, jumped them and they were they were coming up with stuff that was just asking these questions from quoting these these books and these sources and and all of us were just like looking at each other like going where are they getting this stuff you know even even the the muslim what speakers kind of didn't speak? know what kind of stuff? i want to hear this what kind of stuff are they asking oh do muslims uh, eat their babies like what what kind of oh, questions well what what it was was um it's called it was, it's some some book that they um so, so what had happened was it turned out uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump ahead in the story. Um, what happened was I, I I did some research. The reason that this had happened was that even though there's zero Muslims living in in Ramona, zero, none, they had had um, prior to this um, in in the in the days leading up to um, the the 2016 election, they uh -huh. they had had multiple. Uh, the Tea Party had hosted multiple um, Islamophobia events, public events, where they were bringing in, you know, internationally recognized speakers um, who were, you know, Islam Islamophobia speakers. So the whole town was kind of like in an uproar. 
thinking of you know all these things about you know about Islam and um, so that's where it came from but so they they were quoting from some book called um, something about the traveler and it, it was it's a very obscure book that they they pulled out um, and it's supposed to be how a Muslim is supposed to behave themselves when they're when they're traveling and they're not in the Muslim world or something I mean it's a very obscure book um, but it, you know it's, it's, it's it's a, it had bad stuff and it. it was, you know, saying, you know, different things about how, you know, the non-Muslim world was, was evil, blah, blah, blah. And um, so they're quoting, you know, this just really, you know, bizarre, obscure stuff. And, and of course, none of the speakers had heard of the book. They didn't know anything about that book. And, I, and um, so we were just, you know, was it written? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a wild guess here, but, I'm thinking that the travel was written by a non-Muslim dude. No, no, it was a, uh, it was one of these um, really um, kind of radical thinking sort of Wahhabi type um, oh, shit. No, things. It, it, yeah, it was, it was a real, real thing, but it was just, it was just very obscure. Um, yeah. You know, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't any, it was it was like not mainstream by any stretch. It was just some really just radical, weird, you know, sect. Um, and somehow they got a hold of this book and they were promoting it as 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 if it represented all Muslims. Um so Ooh. yeah, that so yeah, I was it was that was a bit rough. It was a it was a rough event. Um and uh, my speakers, I just felt so terrible for them because they're just so humble and sweet and nice and they were just getting just getting chewed up and spit out it was See, it was you don't fun go in a republican district without a stand up comedian i mean come on steve do we uh, next totally. time you go yeah. hit me up yeah. i'll i'll come i'll bring a bunch of my muslim female you know or female or male muslim comics along with me and we're going to have a grand old time it will be a lot of fun yeah, that'd be great. I'm gonna have to rewrite my strategy, uh, my strategy documents to uh, inc include that. Bless you. Look at that! I, I became allergic to the, you know, the, just the ignorance. It's uh, causing me allergies. <laughs> uh, my goodness, I am. Um, I actually wanted to ask you. Uh, we were. You just brought up Wahhabism, and um, you know, it's interesting. Every religion, I feel, has these extreme assholes. Right? I call them extreme assholes. Mm -hmm. Every religion has them. Every religion, no religion is, you know, is, uh, you know, forbidden from him. Every religion has. So in Islam, we got the Wahhabis, right? And the Wahhabism, as you know, um, is a, a, a has birthplace is Saudi Arabia. I mean, this is where the Wahhabis mostly they try to spread this ideology around to poor Muslim countries as much as they can because they want to control the narrative of what Islam really is, uh, which you and I both know uh, is what Wahhabism preaches is not what Islam is. Um, I want to talk to you about, uh, and, and, and that, and that I, I think that Wahhabism is really what gave birth to because of how September 11th even came around. It's that kind of radicalization that has led to, you know, the, the sad the sad tragedy of September 11th. However, what I wanted to talk to you about is you were you said that you were a hardcore evangelical. Now, we uh, you know you, the, with the likes of your uh, Joel Osteen and uh, all these uh, lovely people. Um, what are your kind of? I, I know you're an ex evangelical, if that's safe to say. What are your kind of thoughts yeah. on? To me, Joel Osteen is. I guess to me, he's like kind of the radical side of an evangelical. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I don't know if I'd, I'd call him radical in the same way. I think, I think those guys are more, are more charlatans. They're, they're just fakes. Um, yeah. You know, they, um, I don't know what goes on in their head but they're, they're getting very, very wealthy. Um, I was, I was actually at that church. Um, I, I had a, I, I spoke um, at Rice Texas University. Washington. What's that? The yeah. Texas yeah. In, uh, in Houston. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I pulled right up to, I didn't go inside, but boy, it's a, it's a, it takes up an, an entire huge, it's right off the, it's right off the freeway and it takes up like, you know, between one exit and another exit. It was just like this, this huge massive facility with underground parking and everything and um 
Um, but yeah, no, those guys, I don't know what they're thinking, but they're, they're just extremely wealthy and they keep saying the things that they say and, um, people flock to them. And, you know, I, I was just, I was just addressing, um, you know, this other guy, um, Ravi something, uh, another evangelical, you know, um, mega church pastor has just, um, been, um, you know, uh, it's, it's just come out that, that there's all this, you know, sex abuse people coming forward and stuff, you know, with him. And, um, and, and I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, I mean, we just create this celebrity mentality within the, within, um, the church. It happens a little bit in, in Islam too, but, uh, um, sure. we see it in, in, uh, in the church where, you know, the people just flock to these, these guys and, you know, they're, they're, they're incredibly talented speakers. They have good organizational skills. And so they put those two things together and, you know, they create this, you know, this, this mega church. Um, but I'm not, I don't think it really has, um, you know, a very, has a very tenuous connection with anything related to, you know, actual Jesus. Um, it's, right. it's something, you know, completely different um, that makes people feel good. And, and um, so, yeah, so, you know, I mean, it's not, I don't, I don't consider it as, as radical in the sense that they're not, you know, they're not, they're not hurting anybody um, right. other than the fact that a lot of times these celebrities end up being abusive individuals they are narcissists and, and, you know, you know, whatever um, guilty of right. s- sex assaults and things like that. But, um, but right. you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's just fool- foolishness in my opinion. It's, 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 it's foolishness. I mean, to me, you know what it is, Steve. It's like the, the these uh, these charlatans, these uh, you know evangelical pastors. I, I'm curious that although the Catholic Church has a lot of money and Catholic Church has done a pretty good job at, uh, or at least they try to cover up all these you know sexual abuse with the the pedophilia charges and all that with their with their uh, you know priests. But now you have why why do evangel? I mean. How is it that evangelicals get such big followings? Like, what is that about? Like, is that part of like the the teachings in evangelical, you know, uh, faith is that you know that you have to have these mega churches? It's like, what what is that about? Like, why Catholicism doesn't really have that, but evangelicals do. Why is that? Where does that yeah. come from? No, no, it's a. I'll tell you. I, I think I. I think I. I know. I mean, I, I've been a little bit a, a part of it i mean our, our we had a church in kazakhstan and and you know we had a it was it was really growing i mean you know we had 300 300 people for, for from nothing you know in, in a place like kazakhstan that's like a mega church right um so um but it's it's about the energy it's about the energy and and um you know the there's there they put on an incredible show so there's, you know, they get these incredible bands. You're not going to find this in the Catholic church, right? You, you find these, you know, in, you know, these incredible musicians, you know, they, they, they put on this huge worship, you know, thing, uh, music where everyone just, just, you know, just they go, you know, it's, it's, I've felt it. It's, it's, it's a really powerful feeling. And, um, you know, you just get lost in that. And then the speaker, you know, he's, he's really talented. He's, he's, really good and he really you know people really love hearing what they say and then you know the energy of all these people around you and it just it just kind of snowballs um and you know i mean there's no end to it i mean you know that uh, um joel Osteen's church is 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 massive i mean that that church has like thousands of people has it has like a you know a jumbotron you know in, the, in there you know right. the people in the back and you know it's, it's it's just it's just amazing you know and, and being in that kind of energy you know i mean it's 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 powerful it's, it really affects a human <laughs> yeah I, I bet it does i mean um i i don't know if you remember the houston flooding that happened what was it like four or five years ago or something like that um yeah, yeah and yeah. uh you know, um, and uh, when asked by Joel Osteen, hey, how is it that you're not opening gates to, to your mega church to help people out and provide them food and provide them shelter, people who are, you know, lost, you know, who are basically caught in the in the um, in the uh, flooding, help them out. And they were like, oh, my God, our church is totally flooded. We can't really help people. And then people were like, ah, you can't really help them. OK, 
People showed up with their phones, turned on live cameras, you know, got on Facebook, live, live streaming. They're like, nope, no flooding here. Nothing's wrong. And then Joel Austin wow. got wow. really shamed. Like, people were just like, screw this guy. Like, he has millions of dollars. He drives like a four hundred thousand dollar car. Like he's multi, yeah. he's a multi multi millionaire. I think he's worth somewhere yeah. upwards of like three hundred million dollars or something stupid like that. And he can't right. open his church to help people out. Isn't that the whole point yeah. of Jesus is to yeah. help people? Isn't that the whole point yeah. about kindness and charity? And then he went on. He went on uh, national television. Was just like we weren't aware. I didn't even know. Oh my god! Totally yeah. was not open our gates and then was asking people to donate to the charity to help these people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I guess do you would you agree that every time the politicians come out and say, well, we can't have a fifteen dollar minimum wage, oh my God, it's gonna increase all this this price and it's gonna put all this burden on the employers and oh my god, we can't really fund poor neighborhoods. Oh my god, where are we gonna get that money? Oh, we don't really have money to help out the middle class that has freaking literally plummeted into poverty during the during the freaking pandemic. Oh, where are we gonna find that money? Oh, I know where to find that money. Let's go and tax the churches. Let's go and tax yeah. Creflo dollars. First of all, why in the hell do you have the name dollar in your name? You're supposed to be a man of God. I don't remember ever in a Bible where it's just like, thou shall be a dollar. Like, I don't remember that. Do you? <laughs> no, no. Don't you think that we should tax the churches oh, and yeah. take yeah. that money and invest it back into our society? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Especially nowadays, you know, with, with um, you know, the church is pretty, pretty openly, you know, making, you know, political, political stands. Um, right. Where's the I, separation you know, of church and states? Where is I mean, the I'm separation? A, I'm a nonprofit. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. I, I, you know, they're supposed to be nonprofit. That's why they're, that's why they're, you know, that's why they they aren't taxed. And I, I'm a nonprofit and, you know, I, I just went through all of that and I, and I read, I read the language, I read the documents, and it's very clear, you know, that you, you cannot be, you know, political. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of bizarre that they're so openly, um, you know, right. you know t- taking political stance and, and still, you know, you know claiming right. nonprofit status. I mean, I'm very happy for uh, the reverend who won in Atlanta, who won the uh, Senate seat. However, he is a reverend. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. <laughs> a man of God. What are you doing? Yeah. Poking your nose in business. I mean, in politics. What? 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 Right? Mm. Am I wrong? Yeah. Well, I see that. I see that a lot, though. I mean, I, and it's kind of, um, you know, now that I've sort of gotten a little more exposed to, you know, um, what happens, you know, among, you know, in, in the Muslim, in the Muslim population, um, you know, I, I see this, this sort of rah-rah thing that every time, you know, every time a Sikh, polit- a Sikh politician gets elected, yay, it's a Sikh, all the Sikh are like, hey, we got a Sikh, he, he's in government. And, you know, the Muslims are like, hey, yeah, our, our guy won, our guy, we have, you know, three, three yeah. Muslims, you know, and the same, same, you know, same with the, the Christians. I don't know. I, I, I don't think it matters. I'd, I'd rather we not focus on what the person's religion. And so, so what? We we all have a religion, and you know, you know, maybe we're this, maybe we're. It's not the religion yeah. part. Like Ilhan Omar yeah. is Muslim. She wears the hijab, but yeah. she's not a Muslim. She doesn't lead prayers. She's not, you know, a Muslim. She's not a. Okay, you know, sure. Right. She's not leading a mosque. I see what you're she's saying. Not, right. But yeah, a reverend, okay, that's okay. He, in the beginning of his name, <laughs> he's a free reverend. <laughs> what are you doing in politics? Like, if Ilan Omar, Omar uh, said that she's a sheikha, a sheikha is the one who leads yeah. prayers, <laughs> then it would be like, okay, Ilhan, you need to take a chill pill on that. You need to back it up. Uh, like, no, <laughs> no, we're not mixing church and state here, right? But when you have literally like people coming that's, out that's, with that's like, fair. 
Yeah, titled with reverend, it's like, okay, what? I thought we were doing separation of church and state here. But I feel, Steve, like yeah. more and more our society is getting this crazy blurred line between religion and politics, where it's just like we turn a blind eye to certain things, right? We're just like, well, but this person's uh, qualified. It's like, okay, well, then they have to give up their nonprofit status. Then they no longer get to use their reverend or sheikha or whatever title you get to use, right? Your faith is your faith. That's fine. I'm not questioning that. However, I am questioning what status do you have in your church, your mosque, your gurdwara, your your temple, whatever. What that is where kind of my issue comes in. But I want to talk to you a little bit more about your book. Why do they hate us? What are some of the key things that you learned while researching and writing this book that where you were just like, wow, you know, this is something that will make an impact in perhaps shift people's perception on how they view Muslims in America or just how view Muslims in the West, period. Yeah. Well, for me, the biggest thing um, was just researching, um, you know, the, the life of Muhammad and, and the story, you know, of his, his childhood and how he, you know, came to be the, you know, the, be the founder of Islam. Um, I literally had no idea, and I don't think that, that many other people do either, you know, that, that, you know, what Muhammad was doing was, was founding a movement of sweeping social justice reform um, in a culture, in an, in an oligarchic culture that preyed upon, the, the rich preyed upon the poor and was literally enslaving, you know, children uh, and, and um, you know, it was it was just a, it was just a really um, predatory culture, and so I had no idea that this was the heartbeat. This was the heartbeat of you know the first um, community in Medina, and and the whole heartbeat of Sharia. People have these these like you know for for good reason. You know you hear about groups like the Taliban and ISIS and and how their interpretations of of Sharia, but real Sharia is, is just social justice. It's rights for women. It's protection for women in, in, in a culture that doesn't protect women. Um, so those were, those were just, just, you know, just massively eye-opening experiences for me, this, this whole social justice element and actual protection for women, right. They had more rights for women than in the culture of that time. He was reforming right. and, and giving women many more rights than they had in the culture at that time. Right. So, yeah. And, and, uh, and then uh, I think the other thing was um, really about the whole idea of um, there's, there's just this, this thing about, you know, people think, um, you know, and, and when, and again, when you see groups like the Taliban or what the things that ISIS does, you know, you, you can see where these ideas come from, but the idea that Islam is about physical punishment, you know, and harsh punishment for this and, and, you know, killing people for this or that, cutting, cutting people's hands off of this, or just this super harsh punishment. But I found out that, you know, um, there's that physical punishment, you know, is only mentioned five times. Um, in the Quran only five times. Um, and it's more about, you know, people say you know, Islam is a religion of peace. And, and it is, it is. I mean, when you compare the, the things that are said, um, for instance, the verse that says, you know, if you, if you, um, you know, uh, kill a person, um, you know, unjustly, it's the same as if you have, you know, kill all of mankind um, and, and so on that, um, there's just so much um, in the Quran about, you know, um, preserving life and, and showing mercy, you know, uh, on people and forgiving people um, if they, you know, if they change and, and, and stop doing whatever they're doing. So, um, yeah, I, I was really surprised about all of those things. Right. Right. I mean, you know, Steve, I feel like, okay, this might be a little controversial what I'm about to say, but I feel like, the monotheistic religions. I'm not going to get into Buddhism and Hinduism mainly because I haven't read the Bhagavad Gita and I don't know about the, you know, so much, but as far as the monotheistic faiths go, it's, it feels like um, monotheistic faiths tend to have this concept of heaven and hell. All the Judaism doesn't have that, which is so cool. 
Uh, but Christianity and Muslim and Islam definitely have that, right? It's just like you do good, you go to heaven. You go do bad, you go to hell. But there's also these contradictory things, right? Even I would say even in the Quran, if I feel like there are things, there are contradictory things, just like there are contradictory things in the Bible. Is that something that you came across? I mean, you were a hardcore evangelical and then you read about, you know, learned about Prophet Muhammad and learned a great deal about Islam. Is that something that rings true for you? Do you mean um, did I did I find contradictions contradictions in 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 Christianity and um, contradictions in Islam? Um, I I can't really say that I'm I'm you know I, I know enough about Islam to you know say if there were if there if there are contradictions. Um, yeah, I just I I can't say you know I don't know enough about it. I I'm I'm, a, I'm more of an observer, um, but in terms of my lived experience. Um, in Christianity, um, I guess probably the, the, the biggest, um, contradiction that I find is that, you know, people, people don't really understand the Bible, um, in the sense that, you know, I mean, my, the reason I ended up in Kazakhstan was because I took my, my, um, white American colonialist history, I, you know, that, that preceded me by, you know, a couple you know, two, two, three hundred years. Um, I can't escape that. That was, that's in my DNA. That's, that's who I was and, and my culture of the time. And then I started reading the Bible, you know, which was written a couple thousand years ago. And, you know, in, in a, in a culture that was, you know, just unimaginably different, you know, mm -hmm. than the culture that I live. And then I start taking these words and, you know, trying to, you know, fit them into my culture my, and my, and my culture, which is so much different is overlaid over all of these words. And so the meaning of those real meaning just, just can't get through, you know, and I'm not saying you can't find it, but it just takes uh, a lot of scholarly work. And um, you, you really have to understand so many fields, archeology, span anthropology, language, all these things, um, you know, and what the culture was like and, and to just, just, extract a, a tiniest bit of meaning um from these um so i find that you know that's really to me the the reason for um the disconnect is that we we just we just don't really understand the bible and we just take take these words that are translated into english and and then interpret them over our culture and we come up with these things that really don't look very much at all like you know, what it was originally uh, supposed to mean. So, yeah, we end up doing a lot of things that don't make a lot of sense. Right. You're talking about translation from uh, Aramaic to English. Is that what you're talking about? Because ancient Aramaic yeah. to yeah. like ancient yeah. Arabic to current Arabic and, to, and then verses and then getting translated to English or Urdu or Hindi or whatever language. You're mm. saying stuff is getting yeah. lost in translation. So the people who are doing yeah. the translation are not good job well no it's 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 not that it's just that i mean i studied when I, I i went to bible school you know before i became a missionary and i've studied greek i've studied hebrew and and you know the original languages of, of the bible and you know i i know what it takes to just to just understand you know the 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 meaning of the words um but then you know there's so many other things there's um you know what what those words meant at that time, you know, the meaning of a word changes over time, you know, um, and um, so it's it's a huge amount of study just, you know, not, not just to translate it, but to, to know what, what those words actually meant in that time. Um, that's, a, that's a huge um, scholarly work. I mean, I, I had a book that was like this thick. Uh, it was a lexicon of all the ways that, you know, these Greek words were used. I'd, you know, look up one word that I found, you know, in the, in the New Testament and, you know, look it up in this giant lexicon. And there's, you know, 25 pages about how this word is used um, at, at that time. And, you know, so it's just, it's a lot of, it's a lot of study and um, it's, yeah. a, it's a scholarly thing. And so my, my conclusion is that if it takes that much work, um, to just understand, and you know, and, and this is the word of God. I mean, if I was God, you know, no, no disrespect to anyone, but if I was God, I would have made it a little clearer, 
you know, what it was I was trying to say and what I wanted people to do. I wouldn't require somebody to read 25 pages out of a lexicon to understand what one word that I said might mean, um, you know, at that time. Um, so that's, that's how, you know, how I, um, that's yeah. sort of how I conclude. Um, maybe God, maybe God just wants us to, you know, uh, that's the, the you know, to, that, that's what they say. Like God works in uh, mysterious ways. So God just wants it to be all very mysterious. It's like, here's a puzzle, figure it out. Don't try to kill each other in the process. Figure it out, have a good time. All right. See you in a few thousand centuries. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I feel, Steve, uh, this, so your book, um, did it cause controversy when it came out? What did, were you having your relatives or friends even, or even people like you knew reaching out to you and being like, why are you writing this? Like, why are you doing this to yourself? I get a little of that. Not, not too much, J just a little. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it, it is a little out there. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, once I, once I, I tell people that, you know, I lived, I lived in Kazakhstan for five years. And so that, that sort of, helps people understand why, why I would write a book, a book like, like that. But um, yeah, for the most part, um, I, I get some odd looks, um, but usually that's as far as it goes. When you go in the Republican districts with a um, bunch of Muslim speakers, Steve. Oh, that, that's a whole, that's a whole different thing. Um, yeah. That, no, sounds that's, like, um, that sounds like a fun trip, Steve. Fun. <laughs> So fun. I'd, I'd love to take you with me on one of those. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Fox News, bring it on. Like, even Fox News <laughs> is like shockingly becoming more logical. And I'm just like, wait a minute, what's happening here? And it's like, oh, now you have Newsmax and uh, what's the other one? OANN, because they're so batshit crazy. Fox News seems reasonable. You're just like, oh my God, Fox, Fox News, you're like kind of reasonable right now. This well, is amazing. Well, plus they're getting sued for all the ridiculous misinformation they've been putting out there. So, you know, there's actually some accountability to, you know, yep. Yep. putting some actual, you know, real news out there. That's right. They're getting sued. What, like uh, how many billion? One billion, two billion for the Dominion machine? Um, oh, that yeah. Been was, yeah. 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 They're coming out. I mean, how exciting. Uh, ooh, love it. Uh I uh, we're gonna start wrapping up soon, Steve. Um, I actually wanted to ask you: uh, Was your book ever? I mean, when it came out, uh, when did it come out? By the way, uh, July twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen. Okay, so it came out during the uh, the Trump era. And how mm -hmm. has it done? Like, has has it been read by critics? Has it been written? You know, has has there any been you know any kind of coverage yeah. on it? times or anything like that tell me more about that yeah I've, I've been really um really actually encouraged uh um i got two really good reviews um from you know the review, review companies um um book list and um book list and one of oh, uh kirkus kirkus who, who reviews for independent pendant books and they gave it um they they named it one of the top books of 2019 um both those companies wow. Um, and then it also won um, a, a, a Benjamin Franklin um, Book Award uh, sil silver medalist um, uh, for 2019. Um, yeah, so it was um, in, in the category. Of, yeah, no, it was it was in the category of uh, I think uh, current events. Yeah, um, so it was uh, one of the top top four. There were uh, was one gold medalist and three silver medalists. So, so it was one of the top four books in that category. Um, so yeah, I did. It's, yeah. it's been, it's, it's been uh, well received um, in the, in the, the uh, profession. So that's been really encouraging. Good for you. So are you thinking about writing another one? Um, something to talk about uh, how evangelicals and uh, Wahhabis need to maybe get together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely have, have some, some books in the wings. But you know, I'm not sure which one, um, which one to do first. But I, I don't think it's going to be. I don't think it's going to be that one. <laughs> what about Mormon Steve? Why? Why are Mormon guys so attractive? Uh, I don't know how to. <laughs> I went to Utah and I was like, my God. I mean, 
Mormons and Muslims are so similar. Big families, mm. multiple children, very, you know, tend to be pretty religious. Um, although we don't, we don't stitch each other's clothes, which is interesting. Um, we don't really, we don't live in a compound either, but uh, very attractive people. Uh, and I wonder if uh, religion does that. Did you find that in the evangelical faith that it made people attractive too? <laughs> No, no, I, I didn't find any correlation there at all. <laughs> yeah, mo- mostly they're, they're pretty conservative, and um, they're they're also um, kind of similar similar to some of the more conservative uh, Muslims in in that you know it's it's um, your attractiveness is is not something that that you're supposed to put out there. Um, so um, yeah, no, I, that, no, that wasn't my experience. I, more, I, I experienced more, you know, more, this is where, you know, this, you know, sex abuse kind of stuff yeah. in part comes yeah. from, from this, this, this being so, um, so restricted and, 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 and held back sexually that it's, it's all wrong. It's all, it's all evil. It's, it's evil to be beautiful. Uh, it's evil to show your beauty and oh, wow. it's evil to, it's evil to, enjoy look at someone and say wow she's beautiful and all of it's evil <laughs> and so no one knows what to do with themselves and so they end up you know trying to repress it but then it comes out in strange ways so that, that's more what, what i experienced um i don't know i don't know how it is with the mormons i i thought for a moment, those, those shirts and ties i'm sorry yeah oh the shirts and ties is so hot uh but i i thought for a moment you were talking about muslims there sexually you know about sexual repression everything also we don't really believe that if you're if you look at somebody beautiful that you think that you know you're gonna go to hell it's like you you enjoy beauty but you're not supposed to enhance it which is why uh again and another controversial thing that you know is that i i don't understand the concept of hijabi models i don't get it i mean the whole idea about hijab is modesty so how could you model modesty you know i don't have an answer for you on that one yeah i think i'm I'm so i'm so glad though uh shout out to mormon hot mormon guys uh shout out to them uh and i'm so glad they don't have a burqa in their culture it's great um so happy for them um steve where can people follow you where can they go and buy your awesome book why do they hate us uh uh, just just go to my website it's steveslocum.com and uh, have a sign up uh, for my blog right there on the home page and also uh, you can you can buy the book on multiple platforms um, uh, whichever platform you choose uh, right there on that home page so and then you can also um, go and follow salamusa.org so alamusa.org and um, we have a blog there too and and also we we have all our events and activities there um, so you can uh, f- follow us there and, and and see if you want to get be involved in any of those activities awesome is it is the salamusa.org also like a matchmaking uh get together by any chance um <laughs> no <laughs> No, but I, I, you know, you give me a lot of good ideas. I might, I might have to think about I that one too. That. I'm all about great ideas, so you can just hit me up anytime, Steve. Uh, it would be my honor. Okay. I, uh, yeah, I, I think, I think you have a real market there. Okay. It's so much better than single Muslim or uh, Salam uh, Love Salam or some. There's like some other really weird websites out there for single Muslim people to get together. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it's funny that you say that because I find really um, that that whole idea um, people, people talk about being, being an interfaith and, you know, you know, Muslims and Christians and Jews and everybody getting together. But boy, I tell you, you find out where, how, how interfaith people really are when they try to marry each other. That's right. And that is the one thing that, that you do not do. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, uh, honestly, it would be great to um, actually, um, you know, put some energy into um, getting people to marry, um, you know, between the faiths. I, I think it's a great way. It's an awesome way. You know, you get the families together. Um, you right. know, it's, it's a great way to break down barriers. So, yeah, I th- I'm thinking um, 
I'm, I mean, if you get together a Jewish mom, a Catholic mom, and a Muslim mom, I mean, they're just going to guilt the shit out of each other. And it's going to be amazing. Because <laughs> yeah. the guilt, that parental guilt is just so deeply mm-hmm. engrossed. And uh, yeah. I'm, I'm about that. Is yeah. there a lot of guilt in, evang- in, 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 in evangelical faith? Yeah. Okay, yeah, there so really is. Throw- um, you know, um, what's that? I said we'll throw in evangelical parents as well. Yeah, absolutely. Please do. Yeah, yeah, guilting their children to be like, oh my God, you're not going to get married before I die? It's just like, oh, Jesus. Oh, <laughs> well, there's an actual thing. verse they they quote that says um uh you know you you you're not supposed to get equally yoked to an unbeliever uh, so they quote that and so no one no christian is supposed to marry someone else who's not a christian oh wow no oh, that's pretty hardcore it's interesting you said that because in islam mm-hmm. it's not like that at least that's not what i was taught i mean you can marry what we call in uh in Arabic is Alekatab, which is meaning sharing the same book. Christians, Jews, because we're a monotheistic mm. faith, we share the same book. We believe in mm. one God, right? Our yeah. our approaches are maybe yeah. slightly different, but it's pretty much the same thing because we're monotheistic faiths. Mm. You know? Yeah, I think it's more it's culturally though, I think it's it's pretty strong that, that different cultures yeah. um they don't they don't want their kids marrying outside of their own sort of right their own right culture or i mean it's and that's how you beat it's, it's, um, uh, that's how own... you get rid of racism that's how you get rid of prejudice and all kinds of stuff is you just yeah. intermarried everybody is absolutely everybody's getting it on with other people like god bless <laughs> i'm a big fan say, of that i'm i'm a huge fan of that steve huge fan um uh, I have been totally been guilty of uh, registering on JDate, which is a Jewish dating app. Uh, true story. Oh. Uh, yeah, totally. I'm like about that life. Why not? Uh, if there was like <laughs> hot Mormon guys.com, like where do I sign up? Like where do I sign up for this? Um, Steve, yeah, it has yeah. been a lot. Of, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me on a Friday evening. It has been a pleasure. So thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I will speak to you soon. Take care, Steve. Okay. Great. Take Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. That was Steve Slocum. And I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation. I know I definitely did. You can actually go to salamusa.org, like Steve mentioned, or if you want to buy his book, which is a really cool book. It's called Why Do They Hate Us? And uh, that is, uh, and it you can be found on steveslocum.com. It's also on Amazon. And also some other awesome places where they sell books. You guys, if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do. It would mean the world to me. Uh, you can also follow me on TikTok and on uh, Facebook at Mona Shea Comedian. And on Instagram and fa- and uh, Twitter at Mona's Comedy. I will be back on Monday with a brand new guest. Have a good evening. Stay safe out there. Please, please put your masks on. Good night.